It's Let's ride. Time for the words that are recited before each and every game here at Dodger Stadium. Take it away, Finn. It's time for Dodger Baseball. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Incline. My name is Jake Reiner, as you probably know, but I am filling the role of Kevin Klein tonight. He is off at the Hollywood Bowl, presumably listening to the sweet sounds of The Cure. Before we get started, though, I uh, want to shout out to our sponsor, Tick Pick. They are awesome. They've been with us for a long time. Uh, I know I used them a bunch during spring training when I went to about 11 games in one week. Uh, just always looking on TickPick to find competitive prices. We know Kevin is a big TickPick guy. He probably used it tonight at the Hollywood Bowl. He better uh, have. Yeah, he better have. Um, so, yeah, anyway, um, no fees. Great for any concerts, games. The Dodgers are playing the Yankees coming up. That's going to be a hot hot button ticket. Maybe you can get a sweet deal on TickPick and get a, a good price for that game because that's going to be a good series coming up in a, in a few weeks. But at any rate... Uh, your Los Angeles Dodgers, they're still in first place. They've been in first place for a while now, but the Arizona Diamondbacks, actually, they've won eight of their last 10 games. So they're hot on the Dodgers heels are a game and a half out. The Dodgers are 31 and 19. We got to start tonight, David, though, with the Dodgers beating the Atlanta Braves eight to one. But obviously the headline is Bobby Miller time making his major league debut He went five strong innings, gave up four hits, one earned run, five strikeouts. He completely owned Matt Olson, striking him out three times. His stuff was electric, looked a little hittable in the first inning, but Mm -hmm. settled in. And that fastball was humming at 100 miles an hour. We talked about it in the chat using all five of his pitches. What was your impression tonight of Bobby Miller? I mean, he looked like he fucking belonged. That's for sure. That did not look like an MLB debut. That looked like a guy who's been pitching in the in the majors for two, three, four years. Uh, like you just said, using his five pitch mix, uh, he induced ten whiffs on the day and only two on his fastball. So that tells you his his off speed, his slider, his breaking stuff was working tonight, and you could see it. His command of his off speed stuff was better than his command of his fastball. And it's interesting because we've usually seen that to be the opposite with Dodgers pitchers. Uh, Tony Gonsolin, Dustin May, usually kind of the opposite there. But how can you not be excited after what you just saw from Bobby Miller? I mean, we've been hyping this guy up. Everybody's been hyping this guy up for two or three years now. And it's to do that against that lineup in Atlanta for your first start was pretty damn special. So if he pitches like that, he I'll tell you what, he's not leaving the rotation ever. Yeah, he has that stuff. And he has that sort of mound presence that you want to see yeah. in an up-and-coming ace type. I mean, just electric, met the moment. To to have your first start be against the Atlanta Braves, the number one team in the NL East, uh, with that kind of lineup that they yeah. have, uh, is, is just an unbelievable uh, debut for him. And also his family in the stands, that was cool uh, to see his mom and his dad uh, in the stands getting uh, cheering him on was really, really awesome. I want to give a shout out though, to uh, Dalton rushing. We had him on in, uh, in the off season, minor league catcher for the Dodgers. And he, and uh, Kevin pointed this out. He tweeted, uh, tweeted this. Um, we had, we put out a little clip of Dalton rushing who basically said that the the lighter the bright sh- the the lighter the the brighter, brighter the, the lights, lights. there, we, there go. we go the brighter the lights shine bobby miller pitches even better um which is was a really cool like foreshadow for what we saw tonight like i said he looked like he's been there before uh and he has it i mean i i was honestly super impressed from the first pitch of the game the way he was walking around the mound the way he just carried himself out there, didn't get phased by any hits or walks, nothing. He was cool, calm, collected, and he and he showed emotion out there. I mean, that that looked like a veteran. It did. And uh love the hype video that the Dodgers put together for him coming off the bus in that fresh fit. Yeah. Uh just just amazing performance from him. Uh the bats came alive tonight. Eight runs. 
Uh, that was pretty great. Um, against Spencer Strider, so the Braves ace. Mm-hmm. And if you would have told me that the Dodgers would be up 2-0 on the Braves after what they did in St. Louis, I would have said you're crazy uh, because they really, really stumbled in St. Louis. So to come back and win the first few games in Atlanta is huge. But let's talk about uh, Spencer Strider. I mean, he did go six innings and he struck out 11 guys and only give up two earned runs. Um, of course his trouble started with, uh, let's see, what inning was that when, uh, yeah. So Hayward homered to right. It was the second inning. Yeah. Hayward homer to right. But then Miguel Rojas with two outs hit a little dribbler to, uh, Matt Olson who bobbled it and allowed and allowed Rojas to get on base. And then the wheels kind of, uh, kind of came off, you know, you had, uh, Will Smith with an RBI double that scored Rojas and bets. Um, so that kind of opened the floodgates, the Dodgers with two outs though. I mean, it just seems like their offense comes alive when it looks like the inning is over. Will Smith deserves some praise here. Forget the last two weeks where he's kind of been lighting the world on fire ever since he came back from his concussion. This dude is turning into our, into a star in front of our very eyes. He's got a thousand OPS, I believe, on the season. Uh, he's catching way better. He's calling better games. His arm strength is better. Everything about this dude is better. He is he has solidified the th- the number three spot in the lineup. Everything about this dude screams star. Yeah, and he had he hasn't he did not look like that last year. Yes, he's been great since he came up in 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, but he has not looked like this ever. And what that what I mean by that is he's pretty damn close to being discussed when people bring up the Dodgers with Freeman and Betts. It's 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 about to be you know a three headed dragon when you're bringing up the Dodgers. It's not just Freeman and Betts. It's about to be Freeman, Betts, and Smith because he's doing it at all sides of the game: offense, defense, everything. Also, this is an, a below 500 team when he's not in the lineup. So yeah. he really adds a lot to this lineup, a lot of thump to it. And I think Will Smith, I, I don't know, I'm not inside his head, but I mean, you got to think that like with the, you know, with Trey Turner leaving, with Justin Turner leaving, um, kind of this this core that we've seen over the last few seasons is was gone this offseason. And it, you kind of thought, oh, are Betts and Freeman going to be the guys to kind of carry that torch and take over the team? Obviously, they are the two stars, but I think Will Smith is now kind of breaking out in a way, like you mentioned, that we've all been wanting to see from him. I mean, well, we all said that preseason. He was yeah. going to have to be the guy. He had to be the guy. And he has up. been. Yep. He has been. Um, so props to Will Smith. We'll get into the the Marcelo Zuna thing in a minute, but uh, just, a, so just, just a few other uh, news and notes. Uh, we got Jason Hayward. He had a home run tonight off of Spencer Strider. Uh, that was kind of cool to have him a uh, little, little homecoming there. Cause he started his career with the Braves. Of course, Freddie Freeman last night in game one against the Braves just absolutely torched a three run shot that went down the line. Um, that was pretty awesome just, just to show that, you know, kind of what the Braves are missing in a way, but any other thoughts from these, uh, first two games, I I feel like we should talk about Gavin stone. Uh, That's where I was going next as well. Let's talk about Gavin stone. You want to go ahead with that? Yeah. So I was actually pretty impressed with Gavin stone. Uh, he had a little bit of a shakiness in the first inning and then obviously his last inning, which I believe was the fifth. Uh, he pitched into the fifth inning, didn't, didn't get any outs in it. Yep. Uh, where he walked the first two and then, and then pulled the plug on him. But if you look at his, if you look at the pitch chart of this game, he threw 79 pitches and he got 14 whiffs. So it didn't really line up with the strikeouts. Uh, I think he only had one or two strikeouts. I want to say, but he was making guys miss. He looked pretty damn good. He the command of the changeup wasn't necessarily great. Uh, I I would like to see him rely on the slider more once that becomes a more prevalent pitch. It's he's he's kind of a two pitch pitcher right now. I mean he threw seventy nine pitches and only nine sliders, so the rest were fastballs and changeups. Um, so once he develops that that third pitch more, he's gonna be pretty pretty damn unhittable in my opinion. I I am a huge believer in this guy. Uh, like I said, 14 whiffs, that doesn't happen on accident. Uh, the strikeouts will come. 
no doubt. If you're getting guys to swing and miss 14 times in 79 pitches, the strikeouts are going to come. The swing and miss stuff is there. Uh, right now, it's just an issue of command and developing that slider. Also, just as much praise as we gave Bobby Miller for being impressive against the Braves, I think we got to yeah. also cut some slack for Gavin Stone for having to face the Braves in his uh, second major league start. He faced the the Phillies in his first start. So I, I think we've got to cut him as much slack as possible to get him going. I mean, you either are going to, you know, jump onto the scene like Bobby Miller did, or you're going to kind of ease into things uh, like Gavin Stone is doing. But I think both pitchers are, are going to be special. And I think that after the that after that rough first inning that he had, he settled down and he kept the game right where it was enough mm-hmm. for the offense to come back in this one. So that that was huge. I mean, he did he did only go four plus innings and he did give up five runs and only one strikeout, but he kept the game right where it needed to be. Um, kind of a head scratcher that they that they brought in Phillips in that fifth inning. Yeah, that was um weird. that was kind of like a like a playoff move in a weird mm-hmm. way. Yeah. Um, but it ended up working uh, because the rest of the bullpen was great, which is kind of crazy considering how bad they were in St. Louis, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, Gratterall picked up his third save. The other highlight I want to uh, talk about real quick before we get to uh, Will Smith v. Marcel Ozuna is the fact that, boy, J.D. Martinez, what a what a delight. What a delight. Uh, I, I don't think anybody really expected this kind of production from him when they when we signed him in the offseason, but he has been a stalwart in the middle of this lineup uh, on the season, hitting 261. He's got nine home runs and 30 RBIs and 881 OPS. But over his last seven games, four home runs, 11 RBIs, and an 800 slugging percentage. <laughs> yeah. Three home runs in this series. Um, he had a home run or maybe even two in that St. Louis series. What have you thought about J.D. Martinez so far? I, I couldn't be more impressed with him. I mean, they made the right call in the offseason. You know, it was obviously tough to let go of Justin Turner, but I think it's clear as day that this was the right call. Uh, I mean, this this dude, all he does is all he's ever done is hit. Not going to ask him to play the field. Just go in the lineup, DH, five, hit fifth or sixth, and do exactly what you're doing right now. Uh, I think he took a little bit to get settled in L.A., uh, but I think he's finally comfortable in his skin, comfortable with his team, and obviously he's familiar with Van Skoyok, uh, but you can't ask for more of a signing so far. I mean, if he can do this, this is a playoff signing. Everybody in the world knows the Dodgers are going to make the playoffs. I don't care who they trot out there. You could start Austin Barnes and Miguel Rojas every single day, Trace Thompson every single day. You're still going to make the playoffs with the rest of the pieces on this Dodgers team. J.D. Martinez is a signing for the playoffs. They did not get any, any production from Justin Turner in the past two playoffs. In 2021, he he did nothing and then got hurt and walked off. And last year was was abysmal as well. He 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 lost the step on the swing. He couldn't catch up on the, with the bat speed. So while this is great and I'm thrilled with J.D. Martinez, what matters to me the most for him is what he's going to do in the playoffs. Yep, and the rest of this lineup. So that's uh, really, really good signs from him so far. All right, let's get into it. Will Smith and Marcelo Zuna. If you didn't mm-hmm. catch this, um, we'll just do a little recap for you. In the first game, I forget what inning it was. It doesn't really matter. But Marcelo Zuna has a very violent swing where he lets go of the bat with one hand swings it around his back uh, with his left hand. And it has happened on a number of occasions where he will strike the catcher with the backswing of his bat. And he did that against Will Smith and Will Smith got in his face about it and said, basically you need to watch that even though he wasn't making the case that Marcelo Zuna was doing it on purpose. What he was pointing out was the fact that Marcelo Zuna has done this to Will Smith multiple times. And if you've seen some of the video clips that they've put out there, he's done it to multiple uh, players. And first, let's get into that. I, I, you know, the, the one takeaway that I had from watching that clip from the first game, David, was Damn, I'd love to see I'd love to see that fight in Will Smith. Yeah. He really was yep. he really got in his face and he said, This needs to end now. I mean, especially 
for for Smith coming off that concussion, you can't be too careful with him. He knows how vital he is to this lineup. We just talked about it. To have him show that fight and kind of get in Ozuna's face to be like, hey, you need to freaking figure this out because you're going to injure me or another catcher out there. I just love to see it. This sounds kind of, kind of condescending, but it feels like Will Smith's baseball balls have dropped this year. <laughs> Like he has taken agency for who he is on the play as a player. I mean, he's matching the production with the deserved attitude that he should have as someone who's producing that like that. Uh, obviously, coming off the concussion is is you know not fun, and when you're getting hit by a backswing of some asshole who's been doing this for years, he had to speak up, and he fucking did. So, do I think this was intentional? Obviously not. I have no idea what was said between the two of them. I guess Will Smith said to reporters, Ozuna didn't necessarily apologize, more so just said, I kind of do that sometimes, which is an insane thing to say also, basically implying that the catcher should like move back when he's at the plate. It's not really how baseball works. You have a batter's box and you can't really just hit the catcher. Um, but back to the Smith thing, it's you saw it in the World Baseball Classic. You saw it then. I don't know what the hell that was with Randy or Rosarena pregame when they played Mexico, when he like didn't fist bump him or anything, but something has changed in Will Smith where he has been able to take agency of his competitiveness. Uh, in the past, we've seen him kind of compete and just kind of like, you know, take the, follow the lead of, of the other guys on the team, you know, the, the, the pre-established leaders of this team, but something has changed in him, man. I, I don't know what it is but I like it. Yeah, I love it. And it's, it's it's this like this anger edge that he has. And I, I don't really know what he has to be angry about. Like or someone anything. pissed in his Cheerios all of a yeah, sudden. Yeah, it's like he's got a chip on his shoulder from something, but I don't I don't care why or how, how we got here, but just the fact that he's got that attitude and that kind of the feeling that like all that matters to him is winning and competing. Mm -hmm. I just love that. And I think the way in which he went about it was kind of great because he basically came onto the scene very humble, very quiet, didn't want to ruffle any of the feathers, was going to try and earn his spot on this roster, which he did through his play. And now that he's established himself as the everyday catcher, which he's has been the last few seasons, this season, like I mentioned towards the top, he has taken basically a, a leadership role now where you have him as the third head of this monster with Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman. And for him to kind of own it like he did, I just love the competitive spirit. Um, and I think most people agreed with Will Smith's take on this, except, and I know this is your segment, David, and you can throw an idiot of the week if you have one, but I have to throw my idiot of the week out there because this incensed me to the point where I was dumbfounded. Ruben Amaro Jr., who is the former general manager of the Phillies, of mm -hmm. that's one of his credits. He was on MLB Now, which is Brian Kenny's show on MLB Network, and, and yep. John Heyman was also on that show. And they were talking about this issue between Will Smith and Marcelo Zuna, which, by the way, didn't boil over into game two. But basically, what Ruben Amaro was saying was similar to along the lines of what Marcelo Zuna started to say in his, in his post game, which was, that maybe it's too difficult for Marcelo Zuna to make the hitter adjust, to make the hitter change the way his you know follow through goes in order to protect the catcher, or maybe he needs to move back, you know, or maybe the catcher needs to move back. And it's like, no, like wh what are we doing? We're we're singling out one player that the catcher has to move back, and now you're disadvantaging the pitcher because he has to throw the ball further now to a, to one batter who has a crappy backswing and nobody else does this in the game. In fact, when, when other guys do it, it's actually a genuine mistake. It's not because their backswing is the way it is. It just so happens that, that it happens that way. But this guy has a backswing where this happens a lot. I think we, I think the guy with the bad backswing should change. Don't you? Yeah. I mean, why, why are we making exceptions for one asshole? And he is an asshole. Just trust me. Google Marcelo Zuna and see what fucking comes up. This guy is a jerk. So second of all, 
I'm not surprised that this idiot said this because he's probably just trying to just make a name for himself as like some idiot on MLB Network who has controversial takes. But what I don't understand is why would anyone ever make an exception that would disadvantage their own team? It makes zero sense. Like it, it, why would anyone ever do that? Forget Marcelo Zuna, forget this situation. Why would anyone ever in the history of civilization ever make an exception on a baseball field to make your team at a disadvantage? Why? Yeah. You would you wouldn't. You wouldn't. So this idiot's just talking to talk. Right. This and, is the and- same idiot who traded Cliff Lee at the trade deadline in a win now mode, in a win now year for the Phillies when they had just gotten Roy Halladay because he said he wanted to replenish the farm of the prospects they had to trade for Roy Halladay. <laughs> well, guess what? They lost in the NLCS to the Giants that year in 2010. So Ruben Amaro Jr. obviously is is not doing a lot of things right in his life. He also suggested that maybe Will Smith should try and move out of the way. Like, that's fucking possible. Like, why he should just play, he should just double up on first base and just have no catcher at that point. Right. I mean, throw it to the backstop. What's he supposed to do? You know, you got Bobby Miller throwing 100 miles an hour. He's got to figure out how to catch that ball. Oh, and avoid the backswing of this one. Not only that, it would affect affect the framing. And most of all, what if there's a guy on base? You're going to move back and get further away from second base when we're already struggling to throw any runners out? It's It's just just nonsensical. It's just a ridiculous. uh, Stupid. Stupid idiot. 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 But I do applaud Brian Kenny and John Heyman for pushing back on it. And they're like, disagree. This is that's this is a bad take. Anyway, so uh that uh that solves that issue. I mean, that, that was just a, a crazy thing. And, and like I said, it didn't it didn't bo- it didn't um spill over into game 2 because uh Will Smith is a professional and let's just move on, right? Yeah, also side note, the first guy who was at that that little uh scrum, Max Muncy, obviously. Always always looking ready for ready to fight. go, just perpetually ready. Always ready for something. I love yeah, it. Yeah. And Max, we should talk about it. He got tossed in uh, in St. Louis. That's actually a good a good segue to talk about that St. Louis series because uh, it was pretty frustrating. Um, the Dodgers dropped three or four to the Cardinals. Um, it seemed like all of the kind of glaring issues that we kind of knew were there kind of were exposed in that series. What we're talking about is uh, the bullpen being kind of shaky and a little inconsistent. Uh, some of the uh, hitting with runners and scoring position issues, even though the the offense did put up uh, quite a bit of runs in that series. Um, and then we've also got to talk about the starting pitching injuries as well. But that Cardinal series was a little rough. And for a road trip that is as tough as it is, uh, to have the Braves follow behind that, even though they've won the first two games of, the, of that series. And then, then, then they have the Rays. So um, I was hoping for a little bit of better of an output in St. Louis, but overall it just felt like the Cardinals are just kind of on a little bit of a, we're on a little bit of a hot streak and and they kind of just put it to us in that series. Yeah. I'm not looking too much into that series, honestly. I mean, did they even have a starter in that series go more than five innings or five innings at all? It yeah. felt like everybody pitched three or four innings and then called it a day. So when your bullpen is that taxed, when you're calling up two guys every single day from AAA just to eat enough innings, that stuff is going to happen. It's a long season, uh, first of the road trip. That's not an easy stadium to play in. Uh, obviously, the Dodgers know that. If you know no one on this team except Kershaw, but there's a long history of of failure in that stadium for the Dodgers. So. Not looking too much into that series, honestly. It just comes down to starting pitching, going deeper into games. Yeah, I, I I hear you. I just feel like in terms of what this team would need to bolster at the trade deadline, we sort of saw where the holes are or where they would be come October, and one of them being the the bullpen. Um, and yeah, yes and no for me. I mean, but but, it, but the thing is, is like yes and no because. They, you know, like a guy like Almonte got destroyed in St. Louis and then in, and then in Atlanta, he was great. So, I mean, it's sort of, you, you kind of, 
ebb and flow with the bullpens. I get that, but I'm just saying that like, that's an area to kind of address at the deadline. I feel as well as, you know, outfield depth. I mean, that's, that's more important for me. I I mean, relievers are volatile. That is the name of the game. That is why you don't pay relievers that much money. Uh, You're lucky if you have one guy like Evan Phillips. And right now it looks like the Dodgers have three of those guys with Caleb Ferguson and Victor Gonzalez to go with it. So I'm very comfortable with where the Dodgers bullpen is at. I think Daniel Hudson should make an appearance at some point, unless he's pulling a Danny Duffy on us. <sighs> I'm finding myself for even saying his name on this podcast. And you also got to factor in, look at what the Dodgers double a starting pitching staff is doing. Yeah, Do yourself a, a favor. Point. Do yourself a favor. Go look online right now. Tulsa drillers. Look at every starter on that team, what they're doing. That could be an option for a reliever down the stretch. All five of them. Yeah, definitely. And also, and also, um, I'm encouraged by the videos I've been seeing of Walker Bueller. Yep. Coming up in the bullpen. That could be a uh, October surprise out of the pen if he's built up enough. It was a pleasant surprise to hear that it wasn't a full UCL tear. Yes. Yes, exactly. No, well, that's, that's why the really expedited great. timeline from Tommy John is is coming along quicker than than thought. We're full of segues tonight, so let's segue to the starting pitching and the health of it. Um, we already talked about uh, Walker Buehler a little bit, but more pressing, immediate, is the fact that we've got Julio Urias, who's on the IL with a hamstring, and then the more concerning one is Dustin May. Uh, more mm-hmm. arm trouble for him. Um, and it looks like he's going to be out a few months. David, you're the you're the Dustin May uh, whisperer. What I, what how are we how are we feeling about that? I just got to stop being fans of players. I mean, <laughs> everyone I am a diehard fan of just dies. It's it's insane. It's, it is actually kind of remarkable. You should do a little bit of a recap for those that don't follow. I mean, my three guys everybody knows are Trinan, Lux, and May. So. They are the all graveyard team right now. <laughs> um, it is not pretty if you're a, if you are if you have me as your chief cheerleader. But yeah, they put May on the 60 day IL, uh, so he's out for two months for sure. They said they gave him his PRP injection today, and that's going to shut him down from all throwing for at least six weeks. So you figure think, this is they just put him on the 60 day. Yep, just said yeah. that. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm looking at my strength three, is listening three months uh, before we see him at least uh, because you got the six weeks of not throwing. And then if he's anything like Tony Gonsolin's build up program, we'll be lucky to see him in three months. So it's just unfortunate. Uh, they avoided complete disaster, which is huge. Uh, t- coming off Tommy John, you never know how it's going to respond. Um, but I, I think in the long run, they, they really did avoid disaster. And I think he will be healthy uh, for the stretch run here. I'm not holding my breath. Um, I, I honestly, I love Dustin May um, as, as much as anybody does. Um, but the thing that has been so frustrating with him is, is the injuries uh, and, and the arm trouble. And we kind of had that last year where we expected him to kind of be a little bit better than he was. And it, he just didn't have enough time to ramp up to where he needed to be. And I'm worried that that might happen again. So I'm not really holding my breath with him. I'm I'm kind of at the point where like you, you kind of get what you get with him and, and, and just make sure that the, that the Dodgers can, can maybe add a, a starter at the deadline or something of that nature. Um, I am encouraged though, with the likes of Bobby Miller and Gavin stone, maybe they could be mainstays in this rotation. So one of the things we talked about in the off season of the Dodgers putting together this rotation, it is very injury prone. Um, when you got Kershaw and May and Gonsolin and Cindergard, and cindergard has been hurt a lot with his finger and I don't know what the hell's going on with his velocity and Gonsolin was slow to, to, to ramp up, but he looks like he's healthy now and pitching well. Um, Urias, I didn't, I, I didn't think that he would get hurt, but again, I, I think that's more of a, a reset 
we should talk about him a little bit. Um, a hamstring. He's on the 15 day IL. It just didn't, he's got an ERA over four, which is kind of uncharacteristic for him. And uh, Kevin seems to think it's Scott Boris's fault, but I, I don't understand that narrative at yeah, all. I wish he was here. So I could just be like, what the hell does that even mean? Yeah. I mean, his point is, is that because Arias is pitching in a contract year that Boris is somehow at fault because Boris always gets the most for his clients. And so he's feeling the pressure. I, I don't know. It's just, um, a little bit of uh, Kevin Klein gymnastics on that one. I don't really understand it. My my thing is is that it may just be the fact that he's not pitching well. I mean, you know, I, I don't. Y- yeah, I don't think that. I really don't think that it has much to do with his agent or or this contract year or the pressure of anything because he's not a guy that cracks under pressure. I mean, he's a guy that 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 comes through in pressure filled situations. So I don't really know what is going on with him right now, but he's just he's just not pitching well. It seems like this IL stint is more of a reset for him. What do you think? I completely agree. Uh, I, I think it would. I think he could have made his next start if he had to. I think it was that kind of a situation. Uh, but giving him one or two starts off is not the worst thing in the world. Uh, you know, he hit his innings limit career high. I think both of the last two years. Uh, so trying to keep him a little bit fresh while giving him that mental reset also is probably going to behoove the Dodgers in the long term, especially when you got opportunities to get Stone and Miller in there, and it's kind of a seamless transition. Now, if another guy goes down, you might be in trouble, or you might be calling up one of these double-A guys unless you know Michael Grove can be a Band-Aid for a little bit, but I don't want to. I don't want to say anything else because apparently I'm I'm a bad bad luck charm for people getting injured. Yeah, yeah. Literally yeah. the last podcast we had, we were having the debate of May and Gonsolin, uh, being on the same level health wise, being <laughs> able to stay healthy, and I was like, no, fuck you. May isn't on that level with one fucking injury, and then literally fucking two days later, he's he's out. Yeah. So I'm just gonna shut the fuck up. Yeah, I guess I guess that is the sign that you are reading there. Um, for Kershaw. He just got put on the bereavement list. Um, his mother just passed away, so he's he's dealing with a lot. I know we had I know we had a question about concerns that he's been a little shaky his past two outings. I would just give him time. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's anything to it. Um, he's just got to uh, take care of what he's got to take care of, and hopefully when he comes back, he will be reset and can pitch like he was. You know, pretty much every outing before the last couple, uh, he's been he's been terrific so far. Mm-hmm. Um. So let's uh let's talk a little let's get some uh some questions in here um from our listeners. Unless you had did you have anything else on uh the Cardinal series or anything? No. Okay, good. All right. So uh one of our loyal listeners, Ryan at Catch the Blues. This is kind of an interesting uh question that we we kind of went over a little bit, but he he sent this uh this tweet out before. Bobby Miller starts. So I want to make sure we have the proper context here. He said, if Stone and Miller look not ready for prime time in their first few starts, do you think Friedman feels more motivated to make a move soon for a legitimate starter so Stone and Miller can go back and develop in AAA? Um, I think you and I, David, are on the sa- of the same mind that like I don't think these guys need to develop anymore. I think they're ready. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think that um, any more time in AAA will just kind of be wasting miles on their precious young arms that we need. Um, And even though that tweet was sent before the Bobby Miller outing, um, the stone out, the stone, the two stone outings are a little, he was a little shaky, even though he settled down a little bit, um, give him a little bit more time. But I think Bobby Miller's ready. I mean, he has the attitude there. I do think that regardless, I think Friedman needs to go out there and make a move for a starter, but the immediacy of trying to go out there right now to do it, I don't think is there because you have guys like Stone and Miller. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I I mean, I think obviously both of them can still develop. Uh, Like I said, I think Stone particularly needs to develop that third pitch. It needs to come along. Uh, We saw it with Dustin May. Dustin May didn't always have that good curveball. Uh, He was working on it when he came up to the major leagues and he did that in the majors. You know, obviously the off season, this upcoming off season, I guarantee you will be spent by Gavin stone working on that, on that slider on the third pitch. So it's going to be, it's going to have to be a little bit on the fly this year, 
but he's not doing it. We don't need to send him to triple a. I mean, he can, he can go down there and, and get tune up starts, but he, 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 He's going to show us he belongs. I, I really have that faith. Uh, he's had he's had to face two of the hardest lineups in baseball right now. Honestly, uh, the Phillies, while they're not playing well, look at their lineup one to nine. It's it's absolutely loaded. And then the Braves, you know, kind of speak for themselves. But I think this is going to be a good opportunity these, these next month and a half, two months to see what they have this year. Uh, obviously, you know, the Dodgers, no matter what they do this year, they're going to believe in both of those guys going forward, but this is a real test for them to decide, you know, can these guys help us this year and in the playoffs? And if the answer is no, then yeah, you probably go and look at the starting pitching market at the deadline. Yeah. Fantastic. So the Dodgers, uh, signed Ken Giles to a minor league deal. Uh, any thoughts? Kevin was on- stoked about that. Yeah. He's well, he's been pushing for Ken Giles for a long time. Yeah, he has. Um, career, uh, regular season ERA of 271, 115 career saves kind of fell off, uh, after the 2019 season injuries, uh, throughout 20, 2020, 2021 and 2022, he's kind of bounced from a few organizations up and down from the minor leagues, but the season he had in Toronto in 2019 was his last best season. He had a 187 ERA with 23 saves, um, I like this move if it can work out. I mean, it's definitely a, you know, kind of buy low uh, move by Friedman. And he typically does come up with those diamonds in the rough when you don't think that they're going to pan out. But this guy actually has a track record. What what do you think about uh, about Giles? This is a non-event for me. I, 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 I think the likeliest situation is he just never pitches as a Dodger. Uh, unfortunately for him, he just hasn't been able to stay healthy. Uh, if he can come in and contribute, great. If not, okay, it was worth a flyer. But until I see it, I'm not going to believe it. Copy that. That was from young Jeremy. Uh, second question uh, from young Jeremy. Uh, do you believe in the notion that Dave Roberts or even a team leader needs to kind of go crazy after a bad strike three call? We saw the Braves, the last Braves game end on a bad strike three call to Mookie Betts. And Mookie that was, was awful. Holy was shit, that was bad. Terrible call. Uh, one of the worst calls I've ever seen. And uh, Roberts, you know, and M- Mookie doesn't really get upset about anything anyway. No. So I, I don't really know uh, what you would expect from him. You're not going to expect anything different, but I've seen Roberts get, get hot sometimes, just not as crazy as like a, uh, as like an Aaron Boone type, but um, yeah, you know, I'd like to see a little bit more fire from the guys, but I don't know what that's going to change. So I would like to see Dave Roberts kind of get tossed every now and again. Now, I don't think it helps a player to get tossed. I don't really see the benefit in that. But we got other guys who can manage this team. I don't <laughs> think Dave Roberts is necessarily invaluable to this Dodgers team. I think Kevin would agree that he is basically done with Dave Roberts if, if they don't win the World Series this year anyway. So, yeah, I would like to see him get a little bit angry. Get in the, get in an umpire's face. Kick some dirt around and stick up for your players. Now, I'm not going to say that that's going to motivate the Dodgers to to then win that game. but it's baseball. I, I, you know, get in there, get mad, throw a little fit. You can apologize after the game. I know that's not who Dave Roberts is. We've probably seen it once or twice in his entire tenure, but I would like to see it more, even though it won't happen. Yeah. Dave will, Dave will get hot sometimes. I mean, he's, uh, he took on, remember when, uh, I believe it was Andy green. who used to manage the Padres. Yeah. Got in his face. And um, Robbie Ray's face when he thought he was just some guy. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> Robbie Ray was in the Yeah, who, is it? who the hell is this who guy? Who the fuck is this guy? It's just Robbie Ray existing. Uh, just Robbie Ray. Yeah, yeah. That was great. <laughs> oh, my God. So, yeah, uh, I would like to see more of that. At least once a year. And that Mookie, well, I guess at the end of, yeah, at the end of the game, you might as well just fucking get in the guy's face while he's leaving the field. But if it's a consistent trend and you're in like the sixth or seventh inning and you're he, this umpire is just railing your guys, then yeah, it's it's time, Dave. Yeah, they the Dodgers had gotten hosed pretty much all night, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. from that umpire. I don't know who it was, but that was the end of that game. Uh, the Dodgers kind of flushed that bad St. Louis series with two straight wins against the Braves, and they're going for the sweep tomorrow. So that'd be great. All right, a couple more questions for you. 
Um, I just would like to uh, shout out uh, Mr. Dodger1966. This uh, person tweeted at us after the Cardinals series, and they said, oh, Dodgers are so going to crush those Braves. Who do they possibly have that can hurt the Dodgers and their green starting pitchers? <laughs> nailed it. Nailed it. Just I mean, right absolutely on the head. nailed it. They are, they have crushed the Braves so far. So heck yeah, Mr. Dodger. 19. Yeah. No sarcasm in that tweet at all. Love it. Just straightforward. So I just had yep. to get that shout out. So uh, Dennis Gonzalez uh, at Dennis Byron. Hi, folks. Barring a DFA, do you think the Dodgers will send Trace Thompson down to AAA and bring back up Michael Bush or someone else eligible? I don't think Trace Thompson has any more options. He does not. He does not. So if they want to move him off the roster, they have to DFA him. But if you've been paying attention to Trace Thompson, I think his chances of going unclaimed are pretty high. So I think you could DFA him and then then you could send him to AAA. But, uh, you know, there's teams out there who might want to just take a flyer on him for what he did last year, for just being in the Dodgers system and being like, oh, well, this guy was good. We might as well take him. So there is a slight risk, but at the same time, it's getting to the point where you might just need to spin the chamber, and if you lose him, you lose him. Yeah, I, yeah it's tough. It's tough. Like I've been making the point, the Dodgers are winning, but they only have a game and a half lead over the Diamondbacks. I know we're not really focused, so concerned about standings at this point, but you've got to get someone in there that can hit left-handed pitching because that's really the only spot that you're going to use a guy like Trace Thompson. That's what they were hoping for when the season started, and he not he can't hit left. He can't hit anybody uh, right now, and oh, unfortunately. Unfortunately, yeah, we're creeping towards uh, Chris Davis territory. Yep. Uh, unfortunately, there. So I don't know how much longer longer they're going to let this ride out. I hope he gets a hit before they make a a roster move. But it has been it's been hard. And I think to the second part of this guy's question about Michael Bush, I think it's tough um, to bring up Michael Bush because you're because it's just another lefty on the bench that you can't really use. And he's not going to really get that many at bats anyway, especially with, you know, David Peralta has been swinging the bat a little bit better lately. Jason Hayward in a home run tonight. And those are the guys that you're going to have to platoon and, and they're not, they're not, they're not definitely not playing every day. So to have Michael Bush up there to sit on the bench is not really an ideal spot. If they had someone that could crush lefties and was a right-handed bat, maybe, but at this point, they kind of have Trace Thompson and nobody else, so it's it's up to the Dodgers to make that uh, decision. Yeah, I think they're waiting at the clock on on Johnny DeLuca and Andy Pajes, who they just promoted to AAA. I, I think they're going to give Thompson a little bit more of a, a leash, uh, let these guys get a month in AAA, and then if it's time, it's time. But yeah, I feel bad for Michael Bush because he is in the worst possible organization to get playing time. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, Everything about him is just, there's no spot for him. It's There's yeah, nothing. it's it's log jam city with him. I mean, the position, the positions that he can play, the fact that he's left-handed. There's just so much against him, and it's unfortunate because he's a really good player. Yeah, he and, can hit, and he's been tearing it up. And well, he, in his defense, he is one injury away, so that is a guy that you you like to have in the farm. Uh, at his demise, essentially, in terms of a major league career. But that is a guy that you don't necessarily just trade because you can, uh, because you know you're one injury away from him being relevant. Right, right. So we'll see good on that. Question, front. Dennis. Yeah, very good question. Very good question. Uh, very good question from everybody that uh, asked a question tonight. So, David, uh, any final thoughts? Any idiots of the week? Any gripes? Anything that you would like to add? Yeah, so my final thought is going to be my Idiot of the Week, and this idiot did two things that deserved my Idiot of the Week. So, Toronto Blue Jays manager, John Schneider, I think is his name. Yep. Schreiber, Schneider, I don't know. I think it's Schneider. That guy. Two things. One, in the Yankees series, there's video of him yelling at the Yankees dugout Telling someone on the Yankees, I, it, we figured out who it was. It was some random coach. Shut up, fat boy. Hey, <laughs> fat boy, shut up. Whoa. One, yes, this is kind of funny. But two, 
Have you looked at John Schneider? Have you looked at him? He's not necessarily a string bean. He's not necessarily the epitome of, of fitness. So who are you calling fat boy? One, we don't really call that. We don't really do that anymore. We are a progressed society in America. It is 2023. Everybody is beautiful. So second of all, take a look in the mirror, John. Maybe you should, maybe you should call yourself that. Second thing he did. It is the sixth inning, and I believe they're also playing the Yankees, or it might have been the Orioles. This is all within the week, though. He had visited Alec Manoa in the inning. Who is who is pitching? He's pitching pretty well in this game. He goes out there a second time. If you do that, you got to pull him. So he went. He he completed his second visit and started to walk back to the dugout, and then the umpire was like, no, John, no, fat boy, you got to pull him. <laughs> you got to pull him. You got to get him out now. And after the game, John Schneider was like, yep, I fucked up. That's on me. No shit it's on you, John. They just hired Don Mattingly because apparently you need a babysitter to tell you how the game of baseball is played. You can't well, win. You can't win with this electric roster. I mean, what more can the Toronto Blue Jays general manager do? You have an all-star team. You've signed starting pitcher after starting pitcher. You've traded for Matt Chapman. You've traded for tons of other guys. Dalton Varshow this year. What else can that GM do? So John Schneider had a week. He had a bad week. It's funny you bring up Don Mattingly because I distinctly remember when Don Mattingly first became a manager for the Dodgers, he did this exact move. Yep, he did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> I forgot about that. So, so I just thought it was really funny that he was sitting in the dugout. Of course, he's not going to remind Schneider that this is a rule because he screwed up and did that too. Um, I also like it's weird because nobody else on the Blue Jays seemed to know that that was even occurring. Like Alec Manoa. Yeah, how does no confused. one? How does no one yell at him to stop? Yeah, like when he's fucking waddling out there. How about you be like, no, stop, turn around. And it was nobody funny too. That it was funny too when when Schneider walked off the mound. The the umpire had to like stop him with his yeah. arm just to be like, hey, uh, yeah, he's this done. Guy's <laughs> He's done. Yeah, yeah. You see the guy you just tried to you just tried to talk to. He's done. He can yeah, walk so that, back. See your with ace you. on the mound that you want to keep in the game. Well, yeah. sorry, pal. He's done. Nope. Time to bring in Mitch White. Sorry. <laughs> like they lost that game, by the way, and they were winning at the time. Of course. No, the Blue Jays are the Blue Jays are bad. The White Sox are bad, and those are teams that I mean, especially the Blue Jays should be a lot better than they yeah, are. Yeah. Well, I I can't. I do this every year with them. The past three years, I pick them I in the World Series, and then. Then this shit happens. How are they I, not good? I do the same thing with the White Sox. Maybe we should yeah. learn at some point. I just I look at the roster and it's like there's literally no holes. Yeah. Except John Schneider, maybe eating donut holes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know about the fat boy part. That's hilarious. Oh, dude, it was so bad. It's um, like, what do you I don't know. I, I mean, I personally thought it was hilarious, but I mean you can't you pers John Schneider personally cannot be saying that. Yeah, no, the no, that's uh, it's the pot calling the kettle fat. Yeah, come on, man. Like, I, I don't care. Like, I'm not hating on anybody for how they look, but you personally cannot be calling someone else that, John. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm glad that that not anything crazy like that is happening in Dodger land um, at the moment. So the Dodgers are imagine, are... imagine Dave Roberts calling someone fat boy. <laughs> 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 that would be that would have to happen for him to have like a really bad day. Something would really have to piss him off. For that <laughs> I time. mean, that would be I, I he would someone whoever he was calling fat boy like murdered a member of his family because I could never see Dave Roberts doing that ever. No, I, I, I couldn't either. No, I couldn't either. Um, my final thoughts are the the Dodgers are obviously I stand by my take that they're better than everybody thought they would be. And I'm really impressed with how they've showed out in these first two Atlanta games. Uh, I was a bit worried coming off that horrendous Cardinal series that we were just going to get destroyed on this road trip. But it really does help the fact that they're winning these games now because they're going to face an even tougher team in the Tampa Bay Rays. Do you have any thoughts on that before we end the show? Uh, I don't know. I'm kind of bracing for impact a little bit, but at the same time, it's like every year I'm like, are they that good? Are they? Didn't they give up 20 runs today? Did yeah, I see that? Did. Yeah. To John Schneider. 
to the Blue Jays. Yes, wow. John Schneider has them cooking after his uh, awful week. Yeah, so you don't you're not you're not a believer in the Rays then. Just I'm yet. not. I'm really not. I mean, obviously they're good and obviously they do everything right, but in terms of a head-to-head matchup, they don't really scare me. Yeah. I I hope that uh that the Dodgers can can meet the moment. I think they can. I think I I think the Dodgers can beat anybody with the team that they have right now, and I only think that they're going to get better with with additions that they may add at the at the trade deadline. This is uh they're in a good spot. I, yeah. I must say they are in a really good spot. Just got to stay healthy and get healthy. Yep, exactly. That's the name of the game. Well, uh, thank you so much for listening to another episode of The Incline. Uh, obviously, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram and uh, like and subscribe and all of that stuff. Um, I, I don't really know what else Kevin says here. Um, sometimes sometimes he rambles and dies, but um, I, I would <laughs> like like I'm doing right now. Um, but it's not anyway. so easy, is it? It's not no, funny it's not anymore so, now, is it? Not is so, it? Why don't you try hosting, David? Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm, I'm third string host, dude. <laughs> yeah, you're third string host. Yeah, yeah for, for a reason. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, everybody. We nobody would want that. It would be pretty off the rails and unhinged. Yeah. No, we, we need we need someone a little more even keeled to to, yeah, to bring uh, you in. I, can, I have a tendency to go off the scale a little bit. Yeah. Well, we'll probably uh, we'll probably join you after the Rays series and the Dodgers come back home to face the Nationals. We'll join you next week. But um, anyway, take care, guys, and go Dodgers.